Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. This is the third video in my playlist covering all of inflammation and immunology. If you missed the previous videos in this section, you'd like to check those out first, you can click on the Stomp on Step 1 logo here to be taken to the first video in the section. And that'll be pretty helpful because if you didn't watch the first couple, this video is going to be pretty confusing to you. This video is part two of acute inflammation. It couldn't all fit in one video, so it spilled over into this one. And this one's going to cover neutrophil extravasation, the cardinal signs of inflammation, and inflammatory cytokines like histamine, bradykinin, leukotrienes, and prostaglandins. We will start with the cardinal signs of inflammation, and you can see here in the top right corner, I've given a high yield rating of 4. For those of you that are not familiar with the high yield rating, it's a rating scale from 0 to 10 that gives you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you'd like to learn more about how the high yield rating is calculated or how to interpret it, you can click this orange box here to learn more about it. In the previous video, we talked about what some people refer to as the fluid phase of acute inflammation, which is primarily the result of arterial dilation and an increase in venule permeability. The fluid phase directly results in most of the cardinal signs of inflammation. Those are going to be primarily referred to in their Latin names, but I've also listed their English names in this graph here. So rubor is redness, Calor is heat, tumor is swelling or edema, and dolor is pain. There are multiple inflammatory signals that play key roles in triggering these cardinal signs of inflammation. The most important cytokine is going to be histamine because it's going to increase the fluid or blood that flows into the tissue. It's going to be the biggest factor in determining the fluid phase and that's going to cause the swelling, redness, and heat. Redness, obviously, because the blood's got a dark red color. When you got more of that in the tissue, it's red. Swelling, because you're just bringing more fluid and expanding that tissue. And heat, because the blood's going to have heat to it. Histamine's going to get help from a lot of other cytokines, like leukotrienes and prostaglandins and other things we're going to talk about in this video as well. The most important signals for pain are going to be bradykinin and PGE2, or prostaglandin E2. And we'll talk about both of those more in detail in a later slide on this video. Histamine is released from mast cells in response to cellular injury, complement activation, or membrane-bound IgE being cross-linked by antigens. Histamine then goes on to increase venual permeability, dilate the arterioles, and prepare the vessel walls for neutrophil extravasation, which is obviously going to lead to the fluid phase of acute inflammation and three of those cardinal signs of inflammation. Histamine has some high yield correlations or topics that I'm going to cover in more detail later in other sections, but I just want to mention a few of these things here to refresh your memory. Histamine is a mediator of type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, allergies, and anaphylaxis. Histamine also signals parietal cells to increase stomach acid. Antihistamines, which antagonize histamine's action, are going to be important drugs. Those that target primarily the H1 histamine receptors are used to treat things like allergy symptoms. And those that primarily antagonize H2 histamine receptors are used to treat things like GERD and peptic ulcer disease because they're primarily going to target that stomach acid pathway. One of the other inflammatory signals that helps histamine trigger acute inflammation is going to be bradykinin. Following injury, coagulation factor 12, or Hageman factor, is activated by the exposed collagen in the vessel wall. Factor 12 then initiates the kinin calocrine system that creates bradykinin. If you want to go look up the details of that, you can, but for step one, I don't think it's super important to know the specifics of that. Bradykinin then goes on to play an important role in pain. It also has 
some action as arterial dilation and increase in venial permeability. Again, there's some high yield correlations here that are going to be covered in later videos in more detail, but just to refresh your memory, coagulation factor 12 or Hagman factor is going to be covered more in the clotting section because it's important in that system. Angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE is something that breaks down bradykinin. Therefore, ACE inhibitors increase bradykinin levels and can cause cough, angioedema, and vasodilation. Now we can start talking about leukotrienes and prostaglandins. Depending on what device you're viewing this video on or how good your Wi-Fi is, this graph may be difficult to read. So I would suggest heading to my website and finding the page for this video and you'll find high quality pictures for all the graphs and flow charts I have. Arachidonic acid is turned into prostaglandins and leukotrienes. An arachidonic acid is created when the cell membrane phospholipids are acted upon phospholipase A2 enzyme. Phospholipase A2 is going to be triggered by certain cytokines and signals or calcium being spilled into the cytosol as a result of cellular injury. Once you have arachidonic acid, it can be acted on by cyclooxygenase or COX to give you prostaglandins or arachidonic acid can be acted on by lipooxygenase to give you leukotrienes. Both prostaglandins and leukotrienes are going to be important to acute inflammation. They contribute to the fluid phase, help histamine out, causing arterial dilation and venial, an increase in venial permeability. Additionally, some of these specific molecules in these two classes have some other functions. PGE2, or prostaglandin A2, is involved in the signaling process for pain and fever. LTB4, or leukotriene B4, is a chemotactic factor, which means that it attracts neutrophils to the site of injury. So once leukocytes, like neutrophils, get into the tissue, the way that they get to the specific site of injury is following these chemotactic factors. Now there are a lot of other specific prostaglandins and leukotrienes you can learn about if you like. But again, I don't think it's super important for step one to memorize the exact functions of all of those. So I've just sort of grouped the rest of the prostaglandins and leukotrienes into this group of other. And some of these leukotrienes are going to be involved in the pathophysiology of asthma and create bronchoconstriction. And some of these generic prostaglandins and leukotrienes I'm talking about as I mentioned, already contribute to acute inflammation. Inhibition of both prostaglandins and leukotrienes can be used as a way to decrease pain and inflammation. Corticosteroids inhibit phospholipase A2 to decrease the levels of prostaglandins and do leukotrienes. You're inhibiting the formation of arachidonic acid, which then leads to less prostaglandins and leukotrienes. NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are going to inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme, and that's going to lead to lower levels of just prostaglandins. Another interesting clinical correlation is going to be that synthetic prostaglandins can be used to keep a patent ductus arteriosus, PDA, open in a newborn. And this might be required in some situations if they have a heart defect and that PDA is the only route for blood flow to get through the heart correctly. Alternatively, NSAIDs like endomethacin can be used to close a PDA on purpose. If that's the only abnormality and you're trying to fix that, you would just give an NSAID for that. Now we can talk about neutrophil extravasation. This is the process by which neutrophils exit the circulatory system and get into the damaged tissue. A little later in acute inflammation, macrophages will use this exact same process to get into the affected tissue. But generally, step one questions focus more on neutrophils doing this. Neutrophil extravasation goes through a set of distinct steps. The first of these steps is margination. 
This is when dilation of the vessels cause enough turbulence to force the neutrophils and other blood cells from the inner portion of the vessel to the peripheral portions, to the outside. So rather than just flying right through the vessel down the middle of it, it's going to be forced more towards the outside and sort of bounce into the wall. Rolling is the next step. It is a result of cytokines, which cause the release of selectins on the surface of the endothelium cells lining the surface of the vessel. Selectins loosely interact with carbohydrates on the surface of the neutrophils called Cilial Lewis X. This interaction causes the neutrophil to sort of stick to the vessel wall. So now instead of bouncing along the vessel wall, it's going to roll along the vessel wall. And that's because these loose interactions for a split second stick one part of the neutrophil to one part of the wall. And then that, that one interaction will eventually go away, but a very small portion over, there's going to be another interaction between the neutrophil on the wall, and this just repeats and you're getting sort of a rolling effect. The next step is going to be adhesion. This is where additional cytokines cause the expression of CAMs, cellular adhesion molecules, on the surface of the endothelial cells of the vessel wall, as well as integrins on the surface of the neutrophil. Now this interaction is going to be much tighter than the rolling interaction. So rather than having this a loose interaction causing rolling, now the neutrophil is actually going to stop in one place because the interaction is very tight. Once the neutrophil is stuck in one spot on the vessel wall, it moves on to transmigration. This is when the neutrophil squeezes in between adjacent endothelial cells to get out of the vessel. Once it's through the vessel wall and into the tissue, it can go on to migration. This is when the neutrophil travels towards the specific site of injury by being attracted to chemotactic factors, leukotriene B4, C5A complement, and interleukin-8 or IL-8. These chemotactic factors are sort of the bat signals to bring the neutrophils to the affected area. Here's a summary table of those interactions that cause these different steps in the neutrophil extravasation. Again, this is a topic you could dive into much more detail on, figuring out exactly which cytokines cause the creation of exactly what adhesion molecules and so on. But I think that's going a little overboard for step one, because you're going to be able to get a majority of these questions right just with what I've covered so far. That brings us to the end of this video. If you like this video and like me to make more, please tell your friends and classmates about Stomp on Step 1. I don't have the resources or time to do much advertising or spend all day on forums trying to get people to learn about my videos, so I'm really relying on those of you who like the videos to help me spread the word. Before diving into immunology topics, we're going to wrap up the rest of inflammation with the next video. It's going to cover the complement system, healing, scar formation, granulomas, and the difference between transidate and exudate. It's sort of everything related to inflammation that didn't fit in the first few videos. If you'd like to see that video, you can please click this black box here and you'll be taken directly to that. Thanks for watching and good luck with the rest of your studying.